Welcome, y'all. So glad you're here. We're going to just take a moment to settle in here and wait for a few more arrivals. Yeah, feel free to be on camera with us. It makes me feel less alone out here. The sea is swerves. And uh, if there's anything else you need to just feel a little more settled and um, luscious and in your joy, like a glass of water or tea, now's a great time to grab that. And I'll uh, listen to a few more tunes as we settle in. <laughs> As the music fades, um, we will welcome a few others. I was just sharing Zoom links as others were finding their way to us, but glad y'all made it here. So good to be with you all. And um, for those of you I haven't met yet or shared space with, my name is Nick. I am a somatic and pleasure coach. I'm a facilitator of organizational development and change, and I am a student of miracles, y'all and your humble guide for today. Um, I, I'll also kind of be playing the role of habits nerd or like minister of the habit formation church today because I am so obsessed with habits and so stoked to share this curriculum with y'all at the top of the year. And if it feels good to just introduce yourself in the chat, we're a small group, which is exciting to me because we can actually dig into some sharing today. Um, so just go ahead and drop your name, location, and how about like a, a word or feeling, maybe a mood for what comes up in you when I say it's time to form new habits. And just like notice what comes up in you when I say it's time to form new habits. And you can share that like that yuck or that yum or whatever arises in you with that. Say hello in the chat. Introduce yourselves more fully. And I'll start to, by offering us some disclaimers for our work as you're saying hi to each other. Yeah, so this is just like a little bit of what this workshop is gonna be and what it's not gonna be today. Because I am hyper aware of how much pressure there is at the beginning of the year to like set goals and form new habits. Yeah, and I'm, I'm also aware that like this workshop might feel like it sits inside of that trend. And, um, and I want to offer, I think some of you have actually heard me say this in individual coaching spaces, but a teaching from a meditation teacher of mine um, recently, a guy named Adam Moskowitz, whose work I love, who shared with me some wisdom on the medicine of winter. Okay, and he said that there is no bear currently manifesting anything right now. 
Yeah, like no bears are out like in the woods, just like manifesting their greatest lives and finding all the food they need and, you know, getting it all done because um, it's winter, right? So I, I offer that as kind of framing for our work today um, inside of how much pressure there is to like, you know, deal with ourselves at the beginning of the year, like to secure the next relationship or... I don't know, get a promotion or just like level up in all our excellence. And um, while I do think we're going to be doing some of that today, I want to just like relieve ourselves of any pressure to figure shit out today. Okay. Like, let's just go ahead. And if that was showing up with you, or if you felt like a real need to like deal with yourself coming into this space, like open your palms and you can just like give that in exit right now, like just let the freeway open up and we can just tell that pressure. Thank you. And I've given you an exit door. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it helps to make a sound with that exit or a um, open jaw, tongue out. Thanks, Jacqueline, for modeling that for us. And um, yeah, and I also want to acknowledge that we we can't go to sleep for three months in the winter, <laughs> like despite how much we might really want to and how nice that would be, you know. Um, I like I'm really aware of how much the world actually needs us awake and in action right now. So we're going to be holding that tension together. Okay, and I, I'm launching a program that I am going to tell you a little bit about at the end of our time together today, that really is about that balancing act of being on purpose and really in alignment with the habits that help us be who we want to be in the world, and then also honoring our body's limits and capacities. Yeah, that's why the program is called Focus Your Fire Without Burning Out. And some of you who know my story know a little bit about why that's so important to me. Like I, I, I was burnt out for a lot of my um, early career, y'all. Okay, deeply on purpose and really doing work I cared about, but also um, stretched past my own capacities. You know, I got really sick twice as a result of that. So I don't offer that as like a warning sign to any of you. I just offer it to really ground my for the sake of what and why I'm so excited to share some habit formation strategies with y'all that really honor our body's needs, capacities, desires, okay? Any questions about that disclaimer or thumbs up if that feels clear and like a stable enough foundation for us to move today, yeah? All right, groovy, y'all. Well, then let's dig in, okay? This is a workshop about becoming your own idol in 2024, which I just mean like someone who you can brag about to your future ancestors. Um, it's a workshop about taking tiny actions in service of who you want to be and about trying on new identities and new shapes through those actions, right? But... It's also a workshop about patience, okay? About staying with our bodies and showing up in the sometimes painful and slow process of change. Um, I am not alone in my thinking that change is a process that doesn't happen overnight. There's tons of theories around how change occurs and that it happens through a series of repeated actions, yeah? Many of you have heard me say this before, but it takes 300 times to make something a habit, 300 repetitions of any action to habitualize it. And then it takes 3,000 repetitions of that habit to embody it under pressure. Okay. And how many of you out there know Resma Menakeem's work? Have ever read My Grandmother's Hands or done any of his, he has amazing trainings on somatic abolition. And so you, you know, then he has this concept, he holds a real belief that reps are how we embody anti-racist action. Yeah, that it's not through like signing a petition one time or 
you know, going to one uh, rally or action or making one donation that makes us um, anti-racist, that it's about embodying repetitions over and over and over again that help us to live out those values. And Twyla Tharp, anybody know this book, The Creative Habit? Yeah, I'm like, okay, there's choreographers in the space. I'm sure you've seen this one before, but Twyla, who's another like hero of mine and creative revolutionary, um, also talks about this concept of reps and how important they are in our creative work. So she has this uh, idea that it's not actually about the genius that occurs in the studio that like moves through you as some illusory, like, you know, phantom creature that we're lucky enough to catch on a day-to-day -day occurrence, but that like, it's about showing up to the freaking studio, yeah? And in fact, it's about getting in the cab to go to the studio, that that's the habit, that's the repetition that she makes, she commits to every single day is just getting in that cab to get herself there. And that it's that work that creates incredible artists, okay? Not the like wild and amazing imaginations that I know you all have in this space, okay? So we are going to be thinking about that some today. It's just like how we can create a series of tiny, really super, super small repeated actions that you can take in service of like this idol that wants to emerge in you. Yeah, and that those actions, I hope, it is my wish today that we bake them in pleasure. Okay, and I know that it is a really confronting time to be talking about or focusing on pleasure. The world is really super broken, y'all. You don't need me to say that. I, I know that you all experience that in your own hyper-local and personal ways. And I believe that pleasure is one of the most necessary ingredients to help us sustain ourselves through the brokenness of the world and for the long haul. Okay. Just wiggle of the fingers if you know Adrian Marie Brown's work or follow her at all. Yeah, okay, so you may have heard a quote that I often reference in her work, which is that we cannot expect liberation without satisfaction, joy, and pleasure. We cannot expect it. Okay, that these things are deeply bound together and intertwined. Um, that like liberation doesn't look like us suffering um, at all times. It looks like us fighting like hell for what we care about. And we need to be able to sustain ourselves in the process. So pleasure is going to be a big overscore for the habits that we form today. And I wanted to just ground my why behind that. Okay. And I... I ground that because I think that there's a lot, it can feel really um, disorganizing or disassociating sometimes, um, or like outright rude for people to be talking about pleasure and joy, like really openly at a time where it feels like, yeah, hello, are you paying attention? Like there's so much suffering happening in the world right now. Okay, so I wanna ground that. So with that all said, I'd love to invite y'all into this exploration around the idol that wants to emerge in you. Okay, and I'm using that term idol kind of playfully. Um, I mean it spiritually in some ways to like let the God come out of you. Okay, little G God. Um, I mean it kind of artistically, like to conjure kind of a sense of archetypes or an archetypal quality in you that wants to emerge. And I also mean it like, let's let's imagine the parts of you that you can again be really proud of that you can brag like heck to um you know today and later on later on so that's why I'm using the word idol in here and I'm gonna invite you into just kind of like a, a meditation um a visioning exercise to help you get associated with the part of you that wants to pop today yeah, so some of you already started doing it, but let's go ahead and take the time to let our body experience a little more pleasure right now. So make yourself more comfortable. Yeah, if you've got a blanket nearby and want to get a little extra cozy, you can do that. Yeah, stretch totally. 
give your body a moment of connection, tuning in. And then just a few breaths here together just to let our attention come inward, focus our energy some. And one of the simplest ways we do that is by tuning into the breath. So watch it go in and watch it go out. Feel the body expand and get bigger on your inhale, reaching up, out. Feel yourself root down and in on the exhale. And just have some fun in that dance for a moment of expanding and rooting. Back and forth, back and forth. All right, and the big question we're going to be with here as you let your presence continue to come even more full is what is one gift you want to flex more of this year? One gift you want to extend just a little more this year into the world. And that could be a gift that you want to grow even bigger than it is right now, that you want to strengthen or fortify. But let it be something where a light is already on in you. So it's not like, oh, I want to learn how to play ukulele or um, it's something that you already have a little light, a little spark around inside of you gift that you're already familiar with sharing with the world. And you feel like, oh, I want to share a little bit more of this in 2024. And then get curious about who you are when you're flexing that gift. That's the idol part. And start to imagine, see, sense into the images that come to mind when you're flexing that gift. So what is the environment around you? What are the people around you like when you're giving that gift? What do you feel like when you're flexing it? And then just as a way to deepen into that visualization even further, we're going to do something kind of wacky here, y'all. So I'll invite you to open your eyes slowly and return to our shared space, still holding on to that tapestry that you just painted internally. And we're going to make it pop even more. In three minutes or less, I'm going to play one song to underscore this invitation. I'd like to invite you to find three or four images online 
that help to collage, create a sense of that idol. We're building like an archetypal landscape for that person, okay? And it's something I, I, I promise there's a motivation behind, besides this feeling kind of fun, um, it's something that I hope that you can come back to, not just as a kind of vision board parallel, but as a, a set of images that drive your action and that when it feels hard for you to enact your habit each day, you can use this as a kind of like collage of inspiration. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little example here of my own for the sake of modeling vulnerability here. Yeah, and I promise y'all won't have to share it with each other. That might be a little high exposure for this space. Anyone who wants to can, um, but certainly no pressure to do so. So I was thinking about this gift that I have for really depthful sisterhood, siblinghood, friendship. Yeah, that I, I see myself as like a, a deep ass friend. Um, and and that, that's something that I really wanted to grow more of this year, that I wanted to prioritize time with my closest siblings. Um, I've been in a really deep primary partnership over the last year, moved in with a nesting partner for the very first time, which has just been big stuff in the space of my romance. And so as I've been growing that, I'm like, oh, and I feel a, a real need to continue investing in these other sacred intimacies in my life. Yeah. So the gift that I wanted to extend more of was that depthful siblinghood in me. Okay. And then I thought about, okay, what do I feel like when I'm extending that? Well, I feel mystical as fuck. Yeah, like I feel really alive in my magic, alive in the shared intuition I'm exchanging with those siblings. Um, yeah, I feel like the relationship is a kind of spell and has a spell casting quality to it. So all that stuff is really alive. So that's kind of the landscape, what the people feel like, what the environment feels like. So I created a, um, let's see, I created an image for that or a collage of images for that that I'll share with you right now that also has in it an image from one of my close friends um, from their own kind of visualization exercise at the beginning of the year when they were doing some AI imagination exercises, they created one of um, coming to my wedding later in the year that I'll share with you. So um, here's my example. And you can be as detailed as this, or, um, you know, as simple as you want to be in pulling a few images. But I was thinking about this goddess that I work with a lot, Bridget, um, that she really comes through as I'm connecting with my friends in this particular kind of way. This is the image on the right here that I described for my friend who was doing their own visualization, what it would be like to be at this wedding. Yeah. Um, this sense of like creating a circle and being in sacred circle with others and then magic and medicine making, okay, which is down here on the bottom. So that's my collage, y'all. And again, I'm just gonna give you three minutes here because I, I, I like this to be a kind of draft, um, really quick creative exercise for y'all to just literally get on Google or Canva image search here and pull three, maybe four images that really produce that feeling of the environment that your idol lives in. This makes sense to everybody? Yeah, give me a give me a thumbs up if yes. Okay, cool. Right on. Any questions about that invitation? Okay, so three minutes should be more than enough time. And that will begin as soon as I give you some music. Drop questions if you have them in the chat as you're rocking and rolling here. And we'll come back in three. Enjoy, y'all.
Give me a little wave if you feel like another minute would be supportive here. Yeah, okay, great. You got it. Another minute. You could hear it in the music, the slow fade. So let that just give you a dot, dot, dot on wherever you're at in your creative exploration here. Anybody find like four images for what you're working with? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Anybody feel bold enough to share some of the images you pulled with the maybe title of the idol or a draft title of what you're working with. It's a very bold request, I'm aware of that. Just a little more space here in case some courage wants to grow. If there's a person who wants to share and no pressure, only pleasure. I can, I'll share a little bit. Um, so the the gift that I was thinking about is kind of like a, like community facilitation, like I hesitate to say leadership because that has a weird connotation in my brain, but um, connecting other people through creative spaces. Um, and one image that came up for me was like a spider web and like the way that it is like specifically in sunlight because um, it has that sort of like, fragility to it but also was like really really beautiful Liv you were working with spiders as well and spider webs yeah oh beautiful Maddie thanks so much for that metaphor and for um connecting the tissues in here even <laughs> yeah and uh, do you want to share the image that you found of that or you feel like just the description of it, it will suffice. I I will try to. I don't know if I know how to, but I'll try in the chat. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You can either drop it in the chat or you can screen share as well. Anyone else feel inspired, especially emboldened by Maddie's share there? What kind of images you were working with as you felt into your sense of idol? Yeah. Nice live. Thank you. All right, y'all. Well, that's great. Okay. Hold those sacred as we continue pursuing the habits that that idol wants to embody and live out on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you now is just a few different steps 
that are really supportive in forming new habits and putting down old ones that no longer serve us. And yeah, I want to recognize that and cite really that a lot of this work comes from a guy named James Clear and his body of work, Atomic Habits. How many of you know that framework and his, okay, great. Yeah, the book is is, is pretty good, y'all. It's, it's really packed with juicy, um, a lot of strategy if habit formation is your thing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do have a critique around it lacking the word pleasure, though it's talking about rewards, satisfaction, and um, making habits attractive all the time. But so this is going to be my kind of like mashup of his work and my like 10 plus years of studying pleasure. Okay. So I'll share my screen again here. And yeah, thanks y'all for continuing to share the images in the chat. They're gorgeous. They'll be the kind of inspiration factory for all of us as we form habits here. Um, so this will help us look at the four steps that James Clear outlines. And I'll give you again, my kind of unique take on each of these. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. All right, great. So um, James Clear says that in order for habits to really stick and for them to just embed into the fabric of our lives, that they've got to be these four things, obvious, easy, attractive, and satisfying, okay? And let's start just with this first kind of category of making it obvious. Um, for each of these, I'm going to invite you to be thinking about a habit that that idol that you just let emerge in you could take on on a daily or weekly basis that would fit each of these categories. Yeah, so it's a way of you kind of experiencing like what it takes to make each of these things easier, more obvious, more attractive or more satisfying and then applying them directly to that idol that you're trying on. So to make something obvious, it really means um, connecting it to something that you are already doing on a regular basis. Yeah, so he calls this um, your kind of daily implementation intention. So um, that might mean connecting a new habit that you're trying on to something that you like, you, you do without even thinking about, okay? Like, I don't know, do, do, does everybody in this space like make a cup of tea or coffee for themselves in the morning? Yeah, like so that coffee and tea can be a really great thing to stack habits next to. Yeah, for me, um, you know, early in October when I was wanting to develop a new habit around writing and calling my legislators each day to ask for an immediate ceasefire, I stacked it with my morning cup of tea. Okay, so as I have my morning cup of tea every single day, I will call my legislators to ask for an immediate ceasefire. Yeah. And you'll see how the morning cup of tea actually falls into a couple of different categories here. We can also think about that in the make it satisfying space um, in that it gives me the reward that I'm looking for each day. Like my black tea is like one of the most sacred, <laughs> like most delicious rewarding moments of my day. I get really, really nice tea for myself. Um, and it gives me that like tiny hit of caffeine that changes my mood slightly in the morning. It warms my whole body. That smells like this person that I fell in love with when I was 15 years old who used to drink um, uh, Earl Grey tea. So it does all of these things, right? And stacking that with a habit that, um, I felt unfamiliar with at first or just needed to build some real regularity around makes it much more obvious for me. Okay. And we can also create gateway habits to help make new habits more obvious in our lives um, and to trigger behavior change for us. So what that might look like is if I want to go to a um, evening yoga class, uh, and it, I know that like sometimes my energy drops throughout the day that I can sign up for the yoga class in the morning and then I'm more likely to go. Yeah, especially if there's like money attached to it. Okay. And then even better, if I put my yoga mat at the door, that is going to also trigger the behavior change. So what we're doing essentially is like spreading out little breadcrumbs to make enacting the habit more possible in our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. 
Number two on here is make it easy. So this is really the idea that uh, every habit that we take on should be so tiny, so small, especially in the beginning of embodying that habit, that it feels like, oh man, I can pat myself on the back so easily, right? That we can celebrate such a small win for having done a thing. Um, and that often it's really helpful to think about making the habit less than two minutes before embodying it. Okay. So that the, the habit in my yoga example from earlier, isn't actually going to the yoga class. It's putting the mat at the door, right. Or signing up for the class in the morning. It's something that takes less than two minutes. It's Twyla Tharp's getting in the cab. Yeah, not going to the studio, not being in the studio and creating these like masterful pieces of work, but it's it's just getting in the cab. That is the habit, okay? And that the other way that we make something really easy is reduce friction for it, okay? So how many of you, again, show of hands or just like drop a hell yeah in the chat um, have tried to start a new habit, but it's felt like there were so many distractions for it, or there were so many barriers getting in the way that it felt really hard to follow through on the habit. Uh, and then we get like even more disappointed in ourselves and, you know, feel like we're not agents of the change that we want to see in our lives. Like it's this whole snowball effect. Okay. And what we want to do here is just eliminate as many distractions and frictions as might be present in us embodying the habit that we're trying to take on. Okay. So one example I like to give for this one is that in my intimacy work with couples, one of the first things I tend to get curious about in couples who are trying to um, increase their intimacy and connection is what does your bedroom look like? Yeah, you know, like, do you have a lot of distractions in the space where you are connecting intimately on a regular basis if the bedroom is that place, right? So if there's like always laundry on the floor or if there's a workspace, right near the bedroom, that those might be distractions that are actually pull us out of our connections and intimacies, okay? So we wanna eliminate those as much as possible and then bring things in that help to reduce distraction, okay, and friction. So that's that second principle here. Number three is where we start to walk more kind of firmly into the land of pleasure. Okay, this is the principle of make it attractive. Yeah, so there's a couple of you who I've done some really pleasure specific work with um, in this space. And so you've also heard me say this before, but the, the reward centers for our brain, the, the, the centers that anticipate reward, y'all, the ones that expect it and go after it are huge. There are these massive centers in our brain. There are the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, okay? So different than the parts of our brain that actually experience satisfaction and reward. I'm gonna say that again, just because I literally feel like it's so important to understand. The parts of our brain that anticipate reward are huge. The parts of our brain that experience reward that like experience satisfaction can actually feel it are, are these tiny islands around our brain by which I mean we have to optimize for that kind of anticipation of reward okay this is why like a mouse you, you've heard studies about like mice being on spinning wheels their little running wheels like until they're dead, chasing a, a, a thing of cheese, even if they're not hungry, right? It's because of that reward center, that anticipation of reward being so, so massive in us. And it's also why so many of us have a hard time, like really experiencing deep satisfaction in our lives, right? Which we'll get to in just a moment. But I say that to like both honor the longing <laughs> that might be alive in all of us and how powerful that motivation toward reward really is. And to say like, we got to use it in our habit formation process. Okay. And the way that we do that is by making the habit seem like it will be attractive to us. 
Okay. And you, we can do that by, um, well, through a couple of different methods. So one is by combining it with something you love, which I mentioned already in my example around a cup of Earl Grey tea. Yeah. And another is by joining a community in which the habit or the behavior that you're trying to take on is an expected norm of that community, okay? So we all are deeply, deeply motivated um, toward a sense of belonging, okay? It's one of like the core motivations that drives our actions. And so if we belong and have access to that sense of community in a space where the behavior that we want is like really normalized and really expected, it's gonna make that behavior much more attractive to us. Does this make sense? Yeah. So I, for example, I, I like, I really overdo this one. <laughs> so I belong to like several different, you know, somatic communities that really deepen and enhance my sense of like how normal it is to be in somatic practice on a regular basis. Um, I belong to various spiritual communities, meditation groups that really honor and normalize those practices in my life. I belong to a um, a solo entrepreneurial uh, community that like, you know, normalizes how wild and amazing and sometimes scary and frustrating it is to run businesses. Yeah, so that all of those communities are spaces that make the actions that I want to take on a daily basis um, more attractive. Yeah, and they give me access to belonging community um, and a sense of like connection to others. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, this piece about making the habit satisfying, okay? So this is where um, we want to make sure that the habit is giving you access to an immediate reward. So a lot of times we're building habits that are about getting us to a future self um, where the reward actually feels like in some distant time that we can't access right now, those are gonna be habits that are really hard to hang on to if they're not also giving you a reward, a reward in the moment, okay? And this is where, you know, finding ways to celebrate effort and the small wins along the way are gonna be really important. Um, one example I love to give of this is, is a, a dear friend of mine who I was just with over the new year shared with me that she and her partner were recently trying to quit vaping together. And that when they would, when either of them would have an urge to vape, they would run into the room that the other one was in and do 10 push ups and then high five each other. Okay. So they got the endorphins of the push ups. And, you know, it's like we kind of take or leave that part. But it's actually, it's that like moment of high five that gave them that instant reward for not opting into vaping instead. Okay. And I just love, I love how silly, how stupid it is. Um, and just how celebratory for the small wins along the way that that habit was. Yeah. So I'm going to pause for a moment and I'll take this down so I can take a peek at y'all and just hear for a second, if there are any questions on that habit formation strategy on why each of those different principles are so important. Um, yeah, any just questions that feel present after we've gone through that. I have a question that I will try to articulate clearly, which is that um, my, my brain can often, um, like for instance, if I were to put a yoga mat by the door, um, that might not actually lead to me doing yoga because my brain will be like, well, you're like, you did that. And also, you know, that like, you don't, I don't know, like it will, I will not end up doing the, the actual thing that I want to do. Like I get kind of lost along the way of that. Um, and like, it's almost like it, if I can convince myself, like if I do that, that's enough, then I lose the motivation to like keep going. <laughs> um, and so I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak on 
that a little bit um of how to um yeah in the process of like taking the small steps to get to the kind of end game habit um what happens when we kind of get stuck on one of those steps mm -hmm. that's such a good question alexandra thanks for asking it yeah i mean my question to you would be what would feel like enough in the example of yoga right like first of all does putting the mat at the door does that actually satisfy the urge that you were having to do yoga just a simple yes or no on that yes no no okay great and that still there's a barrier to actually getting to the class right getting your butt out the door cost travel there's so many different barriers that could be in the way of the actual yoga class so if we just took what would actually feel like it satisfies the desire for yoga if that's the example we want to use what would feel like just enough that we could do in maybe let's call it 11 minutes or less? Um, so I usually, again, this is everyone's learning how much my brain struggles. I don't go anywhere. I just will like lay my yoga mat on the floor in my space and find a YouTube video. Um, and so my immediate thought was like, oh, in 11 minutes, I could just do 10 minutes of yoga. Um, but maybe it's that, maybe it's finding a video that I want to do. Amazing. Yeah, that that's having it. I open my computer and it's there. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, right? And like finding the teacher on the video <laughs> that you align with, right? Who's like energy inspires you or whatever it is. But that um, if, if the, you know, the act that we think we're supposed to do just continues to feel so out of reach and like it's got so many barriers along the way, we want to right size and again, make more radically doable the action that you can follow through on consistently. So if going to a yoga class way out there <laughs> is just something that you cannot follow through consistently with, we want to build something where reps feels absolutely possible to you. Okay. And that we're not, um, we're not looking for the spaces where then we can shame ourselves for not following through. We're looking for the spaces where we can be like, hell yeah, I did it. Okay. So I really mean that, that like the smaller the simpler, the more accessible we can be in this, um, then over time, like you might start to build the muscles to eventually get to you. Know, I, I don't, we don't have to like draw a hierarchy between yoga classes that are out of the house and ones that we have, in, but you get my point, right? Mm -hmm. um, that we want to build our muscles through many, many, many small repetitions. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing for all of our collective learning. Any other questions or kind of like um, tension points like Alexandra just shared? Yeah, Zaza, please. Matt, yeah, I saw your hand if you wanna share. Oh, you, you can go ahead first. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to ask about time um, and like if one of the primary barriers is just like feeling like you don't have enough time and that maybe it's like, well, you have to let some other things be undone. So for me, writing is the habit I want to do, you know, and maybe it's like an average of an hour a day and I think pairing black tea with it would be great. I think having writing groups would be great. But if it still feels like I don't have enough time because at least for me, like creative process is harder, maybe if I have ton of unanswered emails or other to-do lists that feel urgent. Um, wondering how you think about like removing barriers when it feels like time is the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We can give Zaza like the I feel you fingers if that also <laughs> resonates for you as I imagine it does for many of us. Yeah, this is where I, I really believe so wholeheartedly in the two minute rule. And in um, the idea that we're not building habits to write an hour a day or write our manifesto or, you know, whatever that is, it's like write a page a day, 
Okay. And that if it happens to be that there are days where that page takes you to deeper inspiration and that the time is actually available to you, beautiful. But the habit itself that allows you to build the muscle of a writer over time is one page a day. Yeah. Or whatever feels appropriate to you, Zaza, right? That could be, you know, the, the, the morning page approach of three a day or, but something that is much more micro dosed that allows you to follow through. Okay. Because consistency is really going to be the thing here that matters the most. So it's, it's kind of a simple answer to you. Um, and one that I think just like allows a little more grace in here for, someone who I know loves to take practices to a much more full, like comprehensive place. Yeah. And that we can just like microdose this one. How's that land for you, Zaza? Yeah. Yeah, that lands well. Um, and yeah, I like that idea of like, if there's more time and if, if I'm enjoying it, I'll probably like try and create a little bit more space. Um, still some, Somehow feels daunting to carve out even a time for it, but I, I think that's really helpful. Can I jump in on this one for just a sec? Yeah, please. I think something like a creative habit, it can be useful also to think about not only time, but also energy. Zaza, I don't know if that like resonates for you, but sometimes it's not like, oh, I have the hour at 7 p.m. It's that by the time I've carved that hour at 7 p.m., I no longer have the creative energy. So I often think about the sort of like hierarchy of time, energy, like what other stacking actually helps me get to that prism. Um, because sometimes um, I can still get stuck even if there's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you so much for that offer in here. And for the reminder, that stacking habit, so which is a part of the kind of like make it obvious and make it easy principles in here is one way that we generate the kind of energy that we need to apply to our habits. Um, and I want to just offer to this whole space that like sometimes we are going to be showing up to these habits without like the bright, inspired, motivated energy for them. Okay. And that it is the doing of them and the consistency that will lead to the results and the outcomes that we want. Okay. This is my promise to you all as someone who has really like gone to habit school, embodied it in my own life and followed through, um, that it's the only thing that I consistently see, uh, results over time from, okay. And not, not just from all my manifesting and my prayers and my um, practices, but my follow through on the tiny actions that I've said. I think I have a hypothesis that this might lead me, lead me to something eventually. Yeah. So y'all, uh, this is so fun to be in habit gymnasium space, space with each of you. Um, and I really just deeply appreciate you showing up today, like giving this some time, giving me some of your time. I know there's a lot of places where you could have spent the last hour. And the last thing as promised that I want to share with you, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this a million times already, is just that my Focus Your Fire program is opening in just a couple of weeks, y'all. And I'm so, so stoked about it. It's going to be happening um launching on January 30th and um there's still just a couple weeks to actually schedule exploratory calls with me to learn more about if it might be in alignment and a good fit for you so focus your fire is a program that is for folks who are in deep questions about purpose career about how to extend your gifts to the world um in this lifetime with those skills those bodies yeah and that it's a combination space of part group coaching and part one-on-one -on -one coaching. So first and third Tuesdays of every month will be a group coaching space where we're doing skill development, desire recovery work, somatic, somatic pattern tracking, and then this kind of habit formation. And then on those off weeks each month, there'll be one-on-one -on -one coaching for you to apply what we learn in those spaces to the challenges and growth edges of your own life. 
guys, so I'd, I'd love to have any and all of you in there. If that feels like, oh yeah, I'm, I, I need that kind of support right now to really follow through on giving the gifts I want to give, on understanding more about my purpose um, and showing up for it. Okay, the world needs us all on purpose more than ever right now. So if that feels curious, exciting, interesting to you, I'm just going to drop in the chat here um, a link to schedule an exploratory call with me, which is the way to talk more about it. Yeah, so here that is, I believe, yeah. And just to see if I missed anything else in the chat. All right. Yeah, y'all. Thank you so much for sharing your images, your collages of your idol selves. Um, and thanks again for being here. Such a pleasure to share the last hour with you. And as we close, yeah, drop hearts and also please your voices would be great to hear as we close together. Come on off mute and say bye. Bye. Thank you. You're the thank best. You. Thank, thank you, Meg. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.